I love indie games. Whenever I find one that catches my eye, I always feel the need to share it with others. However, these games take your perspective and twist it in a myriad of ways, in a literal sense. You feel an overwhelming presence that scares you to your core. You can see the world move in haunted ways that feel out of place. And sometimes, you can't even begin to describe what you're looking at. All right, so there's this new game that came out called Before Your Eyes, and it's a very different kind of game in general because what you do is you gotta use your eyes in order to use your webcam in order to actually interact with the game, and it's really cool because it shows that you can actually interact with the story bodily, which connects your mind and spirit to the game in general, making it a way more interactive experience in general, and it is a very, <laughs> Emotional trip for sure. Definitely play it. Definitely give it your time. It is one of the best games I've played recently I almost cried while playing it. It is a very good narrative driven story that everybody should play Everybody can have a good time. Everybody can enjoy this art piece. Thank you so much for making it developers This is probably the most popular example of this concept. It is a first person puzzle platformer that has always given me Stanley Parable vibes. In Superliminal, you can make items bigger or smaller to solve puzzles, or you can shift your perspective to gain new insight. But what if you could take pictures of these items and scenery instead to solve the puzzles? The scenery of the game just in general is absolutely beautiful. And I was honestly blown away when I took a photograph for the first time in game. There's even teleporters and you can actually pick up items and use them to solve puzzles. There's also a bunch of phonographs like everywhere that play like little audio snippets of these specific characters that appear audibly in the game. You never see them throughout the entire game in the demo or the full game, but you can hear these people talk about specific situations that really make you question what the game is about. But yeah, this game is a physics-based puzzle, so it's mostly focused on the gameplay. One thing that I really like about this game is the different art styles that appear occasionally within the game. In some instances, it feels like you're walking inside a painting. Playing just the demo, I was just blown away with it, and I was super excited to play the full game. In the demo, you have a camera with a viewfinder, which can take pictures with the same functionality as the previous photographs, but sometimes you have a limited number of photos unless you find some film lying around. So depending on the level, you have a certain amount of tries with the camera. You can even carry multiple photos and swap them out to see which ones you want to use for the puzzle. This whole game is a simulation. What? Yeah, but also it kind of makes sense for the world. It kind of gives a quick explanation of like, oh, none of this is real, so we can kind of do whatever we want. So that's kind of kind of the vibe. You know those phonographs I was talking about earlier? Well, apparently those are of the founder's notes, the people who made the simulation in general. So the more you listen to those, the more you kind of understand the world that was built. You also can't take pictures of blue things, but you can take pictures of red things. And it's situations like that where the game will either introduce a new concept or take something away to create a new type of puzzle to figure out. You can even select a photo filter so that way when you take a picture, you can have it looking exactly how you want. You can basically just change the world to your liking to figure out puzzles, which I think is a really cool strategy. You'll find like these little secret rooms and like secret games 
that like are only accessible in certain levels if you can find the item to use and i think that's a cool feature which speaking of, of little rooms there is a secret art gallery that i found in the game because i was scrounging around trying to find anything i could pick up and i thought that was cool it was like behind the scenes dev photos and stuff i love that later in the game there are these mirrors that like change the reality that you're in and that was another addition that kind of made the puzzles more interesting after a while basically to keep the game fresh they either introduce things or take things away from you now after chapter four things really get existential at a certain point you become distorted and you can take photos of yourself and teleport throughout the map which i thought that was pretty cool and then later the camera destroys whatever it takes a picture of so then that adds another layer of gameplay almost as if to say how taking pictures of our lives actually taints the real memories we have because a photo is just one frame whereas the actual memories we have are more intrinsic than in just one frame because just one frame always needs context The art style is this super dithered canvas of dark and dreary environments that meshes both 2D and 3D elements to create a puzzling environment in every sense of the word, constantly making you question not only where you are, but why you are. Only the demo is out currently, but even though that is the case, this game has done something that blew me away, terrified me, and introduced me to the concept of cosmic horror. There's a lot this game just doesn't tell you <laughs> which is fuck oh gosh what the what the what were you losing your sanity what was that that was scary what was that it was like my flater fight response but in audio form what i hated that. i don't like that sound what was My that? Later fight. That. Oh. Oh, I don't like that. Oh. I didn't no. sell the left. <laughs> okay. Okay. What do you got? We're gonna do this. I hate you, game. I hate you, game. I hate you. It's game. a I Mori. I. This is this is literally the epitome of ah. Oh, I hate this. I hate this. Don't shoot. Ah, it's, it's giving me so much anxiety right now. I hate game. I hate you. No. I. It's a Mori. Oh, gosh. It's a Mori, but if it was more pixelated. I, 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 Gosh, no! Back to the water you go! Back to the water you go! Back, back, I'm back going to, the to water. cry! I am back, back to the water! I'm going to cry! I I can't! I can't. Back this... to the water you go! This is the... Back to the water you go! <laughs> I hate you, I hate you, I hate you! Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! <laughs> what is that? R. Oh, it's a door. <laughs> Give you a panic attack. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I hate that. I hate everything about that. <laughs> so you know when you're okay. I'm just gonna say this now because this is what I'm feeling when I hear that sound. So you know when you're in like deep water and you can't see like what's below you. I I'm always fearing that something's gonna get me, and that sound is like my brain saying something's gonna get you if you don't get out of this water right now. It's like oh. What you didn't see the sharks in there? I hate you. Don't even, don't even, don't even. Incredible sound design because when I first heard it, it almost gave me a panic attack. <laughs> like, oh, that scared, it scared me so bad. And even now, like, I don't want to go back to the water because that's how, that's how, like, just afraid I am of something's gonna get me <laughs> because I'm in water. It's so bad. So I'm gonna try to avoid the water will be fine but then of course there's always one gap that's like hey you're not gonna make it you're gonna fall in the water like right there <clears throat> oh 
if anxiety had a sound that would be it and i don't know how yep. the developers did that and i i don't understand i but there's no sprint i literally like <laughs> i went the wrong way didn't i i went the wrong way where am i supposed to go <laughs> Yeah, that that's kind of the epitome of what it sounds like. It kind of sounds like a tornado warning, but like worse because it's like it's whirring. <laughs> I get it now. Now with the worst one. <laughs> Yeah, you okay there? <laughs> no, I'm not okay. I understand. I'm not that okay. Was one. That was the worst one. <laughs> it's 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 terrible because you don't see anything. You only hear a loud noise, which makes it way worse because you can't see the thing if there even is a thing. Like what? So maybe there's just nothing in there. <laughs> That's After probably all isn't. this time, there's just it probably nothing isn't. In there. But like, I don't. Maybe it's just you're afraid I, of water. I'm this close to pre pressing like Alt F4. I I I'm I I hate this, but I love it. But I hate it. Oh my gosh, this is. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay, 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 we're fine. I can push through, we're fine, we're fine. While pools is literally all about cosmic horror, one specific underappreciated factor that can be found in this game is a world shift. Found in several areas are stairs that, to the human mind, make absolutely no sense. However, depending on your perspective, they can work like a normal staircase. While Pools only has a glimpse of this concept, Fragments of Euclid sent me down a rabbit hole where I started questioning what was and wasn't a quote-unquote non-Euclidean game, which technically most of these games would be, but also I'm not a mathematician, so let's not worry about that specific aspect, though that concept does overlay into many of these games. Basically, Euclidean geometry is normal geometry, and non-Euclidean is the exception to the rules of Euclidean. This would be a non-Euclidean game. An easier way to think of it is that portals are technically non-Euclidean, and these doorways are technically portals. Anyways, this game is a first-person puzzle platformer, while a voiceless narrator occasionally pops in. What I appreciate about this art style is that the focus is on the actual structure themselves instead of the color, which can actually help us better to decipher what the best path to choose is. You know those very niche art videos where the artist keeps zooming in into their painting? Well imagine if that concept was a game. This is a demo where the world shifts by making the environment larger or smaller around you. Normally, if you walked a bridge like this, you would experience a Euclidean principle, but because this game is using a non-conventional method, this would be a non-Euclidean experience. Stuff like this is so hard to wrap my brain around, it's like an optical illusion. If you're still confused as to what a non-Euclidean game is, there we go, we're gonna use black marker. Hyperbolica has literally been marketed as a non-Euclidean game. What I love about this game is that from the start, it is teaching you the postulates of Euclid's elements. Now, if you have no clue what that means, 
Don't worry. I did the research for you. I'm so glad I can finally fit this explanation in somewhere. Euclid was a mathematician from around 300 BC who lived in Greece and is crowned as the father of geometry. So basically, non-Euclidean games take Euclid's principles and Uno reverses it. So let's say, for instance, parallel lines stay the same distance apart. A non-Euclidean spin would say that these lines do not stay the same distance apart. Maybe they aren't even parallel to begin with. So all of this basically has to do with geometry and some fundamentals to basic geometry. And then the result is the opposite to those basic fundamentals. Now at the time of recording this, I finished House of Leaves, a book that took me a year and a half to read. This book also has non-Euclidean properties when it comes to certain aspects of the story. I want to talk about this book so bad, but even though now is obviously not the time, don't worry, this video isn't actually going to be a review of this book, I wanted to at the very least bring it up. Yes, I know it's obviously not an indie game, but it's still art. And there was also a very specific photo in this book that really stood out to me when it comes to relating to this very topic. That fits very well with this non-Euclidean concept, especially when we're talking about the vibes and the sheer nature of a very specific build. I'm trying so very hard to not spoil this book because honestly, I think it deserves a read and maybe its own video at some point. So in this case, this world swells and curls around you, making you feel like you're on an alien planet because your brain cannot fully comprehend why the world is bending around you like this. The higher you get, the more the world turns into a sphere as if it's the intro from Studio C. You can do quests for the townsfolk or just roam around this open world. Can you find all 25 trinkets? After more requires a controller to play, and already this is the weirdest game I've played so far from this publisher, but I honestly kind of really love it. We are Dee, and we meet the Overseer. This is a spirit realm since we are dead. The one goal here, kill the Overseer. There's multiple choice dialogue, humor, and I already love this art direction. Basically, we have to get stronger so we can beat the Overseer in this psychedelic 3D platformer. We can use power-ups, break boxes, collect gems. Honestly, this is probably high in my top 10 list already if I were to make one. Jerry and Jeffrey are characters we can talk to, find treasure chests, and these flowers are checkpoints as well as an upgrade shop. So they have actual dual functionality. You must collect items to attack. And later you find Hex, which is another interactable character, AKA your brother. And here it's discovered that a plague killed both your character and your brother, as well as both of you were knights in the army of before more. After this discovery, your sibling now travels with you and actually helps you in combat. We can grapple onto tracks by locking on with Hex. We can also lock onto our enemies now thanks to Hex. There's actually a lot of strategy to combat. While combining locking on, dodge, stealing sauce, and attacking, combat has a very methodical approach that isn't just button mashing. Also, don't backtrack by the way, otherwise you will have to fight the same boss again. I made that mistake. At a price point of only $8 and the storage of this game being 256 megabytes, the download was super quick and I was excited to play this game since it reminded me of its spiritual successor, Cruelty Squad, a game that a YouTuber made a 5 hour video about that was in your recommended feed that you should have watched. Now this game is a journey in and of itself and I will be documenting my journey in the form of days because honestly there is a lot to cover about this game specifically and I think it makes the most amount of sense to separate this game into the days that I played it. So I booted up the game on day one, and there was a warning at the very beginning that there were flashing lights and patterns, people may experience seizures, and honestly I was not expecting this. You initially fly through a tunnel at the start and spawn in first person mode from the sky. There's a bunch of synthesizer music playing with very pixelated graphics surrounding you, a HUD is a heart with an eyeball, and the first enemy appears out of nowhere while you are very low to the ground. Initially, this is an extremely 
disorienting game. You genuinely feel helpless because this game tells you absolutely nothing. This led to me dying instantly because creatures are just a jumbled mess of chaos. When I died, I got a final score and high score, which I was initially confused about why this even appeared on the screen. Honestly, I don't even know where to start in this game. I spawn in Dream Wild number 4509, Scourge Plains Fungal Breeding Ground, whatever that means, and this is where I spawned. I genuinely got jump scared because the enemies are fast and run around you to try to get a hit. In this area, you can find portals while enemies just keep spawning, trying to chase you down. And you can even counter strike surf, which is something I figured out initially to help you gain more speed. Now these portals can send you to different parts of the region. It was at this moment that I realized that you can die in one hit because of the giant flying stupid AOE squid. <laughs> This is a weird game. It's a hard game. Is it a roguelike? I, I, I really don't know. This is my first day playing and I, I still don't understand what's going on. You honestly just don't know what your objective is, which initially can seem very frustrating to the player. This game literally puts you in a state of panic because when you get hit, the music distorts and wobbles and it's just extremely uncomfortable. Killing foes also increases your score. One good thing is that mushrooms are bouncy, so if you spawn near a mushroom, you can actually bounce on it to gain more speed. If you find the right portal, you will spawn in a top-down perspective point-and-click world with different vibes and music. There's a lot of dialogue here to read to help you learn about the world, which does loop if you talk to them enough. Totally not symbolic of you having to restart the game multiple times or anything. In this section, there's a healing well, there's a store where you can buy enhancements, which I can't afford now for some reason, a bank, but I'm broke. In between these sections, there's an Adobe Premiere zoom transition that I found kind of funny. There's this creature that says an extra eye may help, and apparently I need two keys to unlock this, and I, I haven't seen any keys, but that's cool to know. And each of these sections has its own song playing in the background. Now this portal leads back to the dream wilds, but I, I don't want to go back. I, I want to stay here where it's just weird and not scary and weird. <sighs> okay. Then. So far, I found two portals, and some of the portals need an actual kill count. There are new enemies depending on the region, which is a pattern that I picked on because this game makes you realize that you have to pick up on these patterns and look for that tiny red dot to find the portal. And on the way to these portals, if you kill enough monsters, you have enough points to progress. Sometimes you can shoot from your sword, like it's a Legend of Zelda game, so I thought that was kind of cool. There's also a meta strategy that I learned that if you pause the game as soon as you spawn, you can find your next destination. But you know, that doesn't always work. <laughs> oh, okay, I understand this game now. It finally clicked with me. Each kill is a point which you can spend on teleporters or upgrades. Oh my gosh, this game is genius. This game has me genuinely invested now because the learning curve is so steep that you have to plunge yourself into this world to truly understand it. And I also just realized that there was a tutorial. And honestly, I'm kind of glad I didn't play it. I wouldn't have had that satisfaction of the game mechanics finally clicking after an hour of gameplay if I would have just played the tutorial first. Besides, from what I can tell, it never explained the point mechanic anyway. Also, I don't remember a tutorial option at the beginning. So I have a plan for day two. I will kill a bunch of monsters and then go into the shop to upgrade since I finally understand the game mechanics. In an effort to apply this specific strategy, a monster launched me so high in the air and it was really cool to see the foggy plane. The fun in this game is derived from learning about the game while playing, which is why I've structured this review into the days that I played it. Like how there's an ice cream cone. I don't know what that means, but it's up there and that looks kind of cool. I'm honestly warming up to the game at this point, especially because I also realized that you never spawn in the same spot. And it seems like I can always find the kill portal, but not the save haven. When I saw that blue light, I could feel the excitement. And after toiling past the swarm of enemies, I audibly screamed in excitement when I finally 
finally reached the safe haven. I've never felt more accomplishment in my gaming history than at this moment due to the randomized spawning, searching aimlessly, and then finally finding this beacon of hope. I deposited half my kills, then bought an upgrade for the very first time. When you buy something, the price goes up by five, so you have to heavily consider what's most important to you. I guess now it's time to point farm. Just because you kill a monster in this game, it doesn't mean you get the point. You have to actually collect them, so you can't just shoot from afar and expect to be rewarded. At this point, I decided to see what this eye was about, since there was a creature who mentioned it earlier, and it does nothing right now, because what I really need is two keys, and I haven't seen any keys in sight. While playing this game, you have to remember your ABCs. Always be moving. If you jump on top of the eyes, you gain health, I think. Actually, that's not true at all. That's just what I thought at the time, because this game doesn't explain anything to you, so you start theorizing what things actually mean when later they're revealed to you, and you're like, oh, so that's actually what it means, and I was wrong this entire time. I bought some more health, and I think the game realized what I was doing, so it spawned me next to a point portal. Again, another theory that I tried to justify, because I'm trying to understand this game when it doesn't tell you anything. I also just realized that you can sprint in the hub world that took me two days to figure out i found one of the keys thank god now it's time to search for the other key considering how hard this game is i was scared to see what happens when i die considering i've made significant progress and you know i didn't want to lose everything that i just spent hours collecting because oh that happens so many times i uh once i finally get to the ice cream cone that i mentioned earlier it has a flaming skull I don't know what that means. When you get down to one health, it's honestly the most tense ever. And the lower your health gets, the more invested you get because they're trying to search frantically for that portal so you can get out of here. Since I lost the eye, I can buy it again. Cool. Uh, uh, one unsettling thing about this game is the fact that there are unborn fetus cries. Yeah, this is what it looks like. And oh my gosh, this game is darker than I realized. And I apologize for that because I didn't realize that... Uh, I'm uh, moving on. I'm pretty sure the other key is in the other dimension for that because it looks like. And this game is the fact that there are un uh, one unsettling thing about this game is the fact that there are unborn fetus cries. Yeah, this is what it looks like. And oh my gosh, this game is darker than I realized. And I apologize for that because I didn't realize that. Uh, I'm uh, moving on. I'm pretty sure the other key is in the other dimension since it looks like I've only been to two different regions. <sighs> okay ready to risk it all. I spawned right next to a portal. How perfect. But I couldn't find the key. Oh, I'm back here. Oh no, th uh, this isn't good. After about two hours, I finally died. Let's see what I lost. New tome unlocked. What, is, what does that even mean? So I lost my skull. And now the question is, did I lose my bank money and my key? Because I definitely lost health. So at this point, the store reset and the key is gone. And the only thing that doesn't reset is your bank. Thank God. So basically, if you have a lot of money saved, you'll be fine. Wow, just like real life. What if I told you that there was a game that shifted your perspective in a literal and horrific way where the world around you makes absolutely no sense? And the only way to describe it is psychedelic, even though that term still doesn't fully explain the experience.